Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership Through Crisis series, where we will connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important questions to help us navigate through rough waters. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Paul Martinelli is an internationally acclaimed speaker, trainer, mentor, and coach who truly believes that if you can dream it, you can do it. While many people know Paul as the founding president of the John Maxwell team, what they may not know is that he is a high school dropout who overcame a stuttering disability to share the stage with some of the biggest names in leadership and personal development. Names such as John C. Maxwell, Seth Godin, Jack Canfield, Wayne Dyer, Brian Tracy, Dennis Waitley, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown, Nick Vujicic, and Mark Victor Hansen. Paul was raised by a single mother in a Pittsburgh lower-class family. In the late 1980s, with just $200, a used vacuum, and a dream, he founded a small commercial cleaning company in South Florida. He combined smart sales tactics with personal development teachings and propelled his business to unbelievable heights. Just 15 years later, he sold his commercial cleaning company to pursue his passion and purpose of teaching people how to achieve success in their own lives. His awareness and ability to apply the success strategies and principles that he has learned and taught to others led to Paul's success in life and business, including building five multi-million dollar companies. He now leads the Empowered Living Community, a global platform of more than 2.3 million followers providing personal and professional development training and education to help individuals and businesses build and grow beyond their current results. Paul Martinelli may not have a wall of diplomas, but you can't argue with his Ph.D. in results. Having worked his way up from mop bucket to multi-millionaire, Paul has practiced and proven what he preaches. Our interview will begin right after messages from our sponsors. If you want to make money and change lives by selling your knowledge online, do not launch an online course. Only 6% of those are ever completed. Create instead your own branded app and launch the ultimate learning experience that sells. Passion.io is a drag and drop platform where you create interactive content to sell using your own branded app. Forget any tech hassles. You deserve a platform that makes it easy. You can move your existing clients, you can reach new clients, or you can even swap your online course for something that actually works. Delight clients with downloadable and even live content. You can trigger instant action using push notifications, generate more revenue with single touch payment, and you can stream across all devices. Best yet, try it for free for 14 days. Go to masterleadership.org forward slash passion and get started today. Welcome, Paul Martinelli. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, we're super excited to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. All right. So, Paul, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. You know, my path to leadership uh, was accidental. It really wasn't intentional. And I was about, oh, I guess 15 years old. I was taking karate at a local karate school. This is the city of Pittsburgh. Oh gosh, this would have been 1985. A group of guys came in, they were wearing red berets and t-shirts and camouflaged army pants. And the shirt said, guardian angels. And yes. I knew nothing about it. And of course you being a New Yorker, you know all about it. Yes, tell us. <laughs> and Curtis is running for mayor there in New York city. So just a oh. plug for my boy. And 
they explained the concept. And of course, the Guardian Angels started in 1979 in New York City, riding the subway systems. And it was basically inner city young people had got together and created like a gang gone good, right? With the purpose of riding the subway trains, going into public housing projects, going into high crime parks and being a visual deterrent to crime. But if we saw somebody being mugged, assaulted, attacked, we wouldn't be like McGruff the dog and, you know, down 911. We would actually jump in and grab a hold of the perpetrator, introduce him to the concrete and hold him for the police and place him under citizen's arrest. So I joined the Guardian Angels in Pittsburgh and I quickly got an opportunity to meet Curtis Sliwa, the founder out of New York. And school was never my thing anyways. And I, you know, I found a home there. I found a purpose there. And, you know, of course it's all volunteer, nobody gets paid. And so as I moved up in leadership, I began having to, you know, recruit members. I had a raise funds for the group. I had to find headquarters for the group. And so it was unintentional, but I would later learn from my business partner, John Maxwell, probably the godfather of leadership, that, you know, volunteers are the highest level of leadership, right? If you can get people to do things for free right. and lead in those conditions, especially when you're being, you know, shot at and, you know, bottles being thrown at you. And so that was my introduction to leadership. Wow. And, you know, when you speak of guardian angels, that speaks to my heart because, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx and they were my heroes. I saw them all the time and I felt safe anytime I was around them. And because he's your good friend, I was able to meet him a couple of years ago. So that was awesome. And yes, Marks of a Great Leader is someone who absolutely leads in a volunteer situation. So you were doing that at a very young age. Yeah, I was and just grew in leadership. And, you know, I've just found that if you're willing to serve yeah. and willing to do things that others won't do, leadership opportunities just, there's plenty of them, right? There's no lack of need for leaders, that's for sure. Absolutely right. And so <laughs> you mentioned John Maxwell. Tell yeah. us, what is it that you're doing right now? For the last 10 years, I had an opportunity of a lifetime. I was introduced to John. I hired him actually to come speak at an event I was hosting. And I had never read any of his books. I'd never heard him speak. And I hired him to speak for an event on the strength of a recommendation of a friend of mine. And when he spoke, I just thought, wow, I want to do something with this guy one day. A couple of years later, that opportunity came up. I met him for lunch and I pitched him the idea of the John Maxwell team of taking his content and licensing people to speak, teach, and train, and use it as entrepreneurs to build an army of coaches. He quickly saw the idea and said, yes. Now, his team didn't like the idea at first. They said, no, it wouldn't work. And look, they had a right to be concerned. I mean, John had spent years building a reputation, and he certainly didn't want to just have somebody ruin it. But over those 10 years, Lily grew to 34,000 coaches in 162 countries. It soon became the largest leadership training company in the world, the largest training organization in the world. And about a year and a half to two years ago, John called me and some of the other people in his life together at a meeting in Atlanta and said that he was thinking about retiring in 10 years. And he didn't want to go out without having a second in command run those next 10 years with him. And so he had handpicked somebody who had been with him for a long time and he wanted to pass the baton to him. But I owned this one company. I own probably the largest enterprise within the enterprise, the largest division within the enterprise. And so I agreed to go ahead and sell my interest. So back in January 2020, I sold that business and have been since then speaking, teaching, training, coaching, mentoring people, um, helping a lot of speakers, a lot of entrepreneurs grow their businesses. It's what I love to do. I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I was that kid that would knock on your door and ring your doorbell to shovel your snow, rake your leaves, cut your grass, collect your bottles. If there was a way to make a buck, I was all in. At 22, I started my first business with 200 bucks and a used vacuum cleaner. I started a commercial cleaning company, grew that to a multi-million dollar company. So I've got entrepreneurship kind of in my blood. 
Yeah, it certainly is in your veins for sure. And so, you know, I came to know you because I became part of the John Maxwell team and I'm still there, but you're also doing something else because I follow you. You're my dear coach. You are my go-to person when I need to flush out some ideas and you're just remarkable. I love your generosity, your expertise, your intelligence. So what is it that you're doing right now? Yeah, so what I'm doing now is I lead several mastermind groups, uh, one of which you're in, about 100 folks in seven different groups, and then we take them on a year-long journey, really work with them, because what I've found is is that, you know, people set a goal, they start working towards it, and then life shows up. Sometimes that's a diagnosis, sometimes it's a divorce, sometimes they lose a job, it's a bankruptcy, And they're not prepared for it and it takes them off track. And so we've structured the program where they're with a coach, they're with me or they're with their group, you know, every seven to 10 days, just to kind of work together. So a sense of accountability. One of my areas that I just love talking about is money and sales, helping people break free from the paradigms of of poverty consciousness. I grew up poor. You know, when I was growing up and look, you grew up in the South Bronx, you know, we've been told that there's two kinds of poor. Some people say you're poor, but they didn't know they were poor. Well, (laughs) then you weren't poor, you know, Uh, we were poor and we knew we were poor. And there's some limitations and scarcity thinking and competing commitments around wealth and wealth creation that you get programmed with at a very early age, if that's your story. And so one of the things I do is I do free training on sales training, and I teach classes on helping people go from poverty consciousness to prosperity consciousness, to think in abundance. So I do that. I license a lot of my content for other people to go out and speak and train because most people who step into this business, as you know, you're working already full time. So you've got one foot in your full-time career while you're trying to step into this emerging future where you want to speak and coach and train. You want to be an agent of change and you don't have time to create a program or to write all the content. And if I can take content that I've developed over years that have been proven to work in the lives of other people, I license that out. Fantastic. And so where can we get more information on that? Thank you for asking. Just paulmartinelli.net. You can go there. My YouTube channel, everything for free. As a matter of fact, I've got my favorite book here, Thinking Grow Rich. This 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 book was given to me. Now it was the guy a little bit, huh? (laughs) Yeah, the the guy didn't give me a beat up copy. He gave me a brand new copy. This is in 1991. Patrick Hayes, my first mentor, gave me this, and um, he put me through this book word for word for free. And so every single year. I do a free teaching to anybody in the world who wants to join. I've probably taken 100,000 people uh, through that book. And if you go to my YouTube channel, there's all kinds of free content there. Fantastic. And thank you so much for that. I certainly am a part of your group and I've learned so much and continued. I have Paul Martinelli in the head. I hear your voice all the time, Paul. Well, thank you. And it is a community. If you go on Facebook, it's called the Empowered Living Community. There's 2.3 million people in that community. Just over time, that page has grown. It's attracted people. And it's almost like a TV channel. Uh, We start at six o'clock in the morning with kids programming. We end at nine o'clock at night with a candle of hope and devotional time for people and then through replays. And so there's the Empowered Women Show. There's the Black Entrepreneur Institute. There's a High Achievers Mastermind on there. And it's almost like a 24-hour TV show. There's so much value there. So yeah, we're going to put that in our show notes as well. So thank you so much. Now, Paul, we're recovering from the global pandemic, COVID-19, and we're dealing with other types of pandemics. And I'm certain that you've learned a couple of things. Can you share any quote, advice, or practice that helps you most during crisis? Yeah, I think the most important thing, Lily, is you've got to introduce reality. Mm -hmm. I can remember I got hired by the National Association of Realtors in 2010 to speak at their national convention. I was in one of the breakout rooms and there must have been, I don't know, five or 600 people in the breakout. And when I was done speaking, what scared me most was the number of trained professionals who came up to me and said, boy, we just can't wait for things to get back to normal. Oh yeah. And I was thinking, (laughs) hello, (laughs) hello, it's, It's so over, right? 
And perhaps that's one of the things that scares me about what we're going through with COVID is that people think that we're going back to normal. You know, people say, well, it's a reset. It's not a reset. It's a rebirth. There's no reset. Nothing's going to be the same. You won't travel the same. You won't enjoy entertainment the same. You won't work the same. Nothing will be the same. Eric Hoffer wrote the book, True Believers. He said that in times of change, it's the learners that inherit the earth. While the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I just love that quote. Wow, that's awesome. And what he's saying there is he's saying, you know, in times of change, are we in a time of change? Well, we're always in a time of change. He says, those people who are willing to learn the lessons, those people who are willing to improve themselves, grow, invest in themselves, be better, learn something new, learn a new skill, develop a new habit. They will inherit the earth while the learned, those people who think they know it all. I mean, don't we all know some know-it-alls, right? Yes. So I think the word for 2020 and 2021 has been pivot, right? Everybody talks about, well, we've had a pivot. We've had a pivot. We've had a pivot. You didn't have to pivot. You had to redirect your entire life. That's not a pivot. You know, pivot is like a short, quick you know, pivot. This was much more than a pivot. This was a reassignment. This was a redistribution. You got picked up and moved. You didn't just pivot. I mean, if you pivot, it's not over, <laughs> right? right? Right. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Did you know there's an island in the Mediterranean where the cost of living is a fraction of where you live now? Where the property value is one third of any other Mediterranean country where you can swim in the cleanest waters in Europe, where you can enjoy 300 days of sunshine, eat organic food, live in one of the safest countries in the world, while being surrounded by breathtaking sea and mountain views. Welcome to North Cyprus. The amazing quality of life on the island of Cyprus has been known for many centuries. Many come to Cyprus today to invest in a booming property market. Win Campus is a unique concept where growth-minded individuals come together to focus on optimal health, collaboration, business growth, and building a lifelong community like you've never experienced before. To learn more, go to MasterYourTravel.com and learn about investing in a place where you come alive. It is a rebirth. It's a relearning. You know, I look at it as I'm learning to be still as the earth shakes, thinking differently. And certainly you've been a big part of that. You've been very influential in helping me to have a rebirth. There's so much value in that. I think you're spot on because it's your faith. This was a great test for people with or without faith. I mean, you could see the difference between the two. Those people who had an awareness of their oneness with their creator, with God, fared pretty well during this because the earth was shaking beneath their feet and they could stand still and stand at peace. Yeah. And I think, you know, your faith modeled, and I know you modeled that for a lot of people, it, you know, it's in these times of change. See, I don't think people resist change. I think people resist being changed. That's the time we're in right now of all this. You know, we're going to force a vaccine or we're going to force this on people. People resist being changed. Everybody's okay with change. And I think the more you try to bribe people or force people or shame people to take a vaccine or not take a vaccine or to, to do this or to do that, you ostracize people, you divide people and leaders unite Yes. They don't divide, they unite, yeah. they find a common ground and start on that common ground. That's right. We honor people no matter what. And so that's the difference. And so yeah. I, I love that. Love, love, love that. Now, Paul, as a lifelong learner, what are you learning right now? Yeah, I think, you know, what I'm learning now and spending a lot of time in is understanding better how people learn. You know, for me, I failed out of school. In part because I, you know, I had a low self-esteem and a low self-image, and that's a completely different story. But another part was because I had teachers who didn't know how to teach me. And they did a great job. They did the very best that they were aware of doing. You know, the, this is back in the 1970s. So, you know, when they were trained to be teachers, you know, most of the teaching was, you know, write it on the board, 
Read, remember, repeat. That was learning. Read, remember, repeat. Well, what do you do with the kid like me who's a kinetic learner that has to touch things, that learns kinetically? Well, you know, I would be in class, you know, banging my pencil on the desk, listening and paying attention. I would get yelled at for banging the pencil because I wasn't paying attention to stop banging the pencil. And the minute I stopped banging the pencil, I stopped learning. I stopped listening. That's right. I needed to be able to do something with that energy. I'm a kinetic learner. I know you work with people in different personality style and behavioral sciences. And I know that's an area for you. And it's amazing. It's something as simple as a disc assessment, you know, leads people to major epiphanies. For me, I can remember when I first took discs years ago and you know, found out that I was a D. And now I realize why I couldn't pay attention in class. You know, my brother, David, he's a PhD in civil engineering. He's a high C. So my whole life, I was being compared to my next older brother, David, who had the personality style, somebody who could sit there and look at numbers all day long and analyze them and go down the rabbit hole where me, In the first five seconds, I was lost. You know, I wanted nothing to do with it. Big picture, right? Big ideas. Let's get it and move on. And so one of the things that I'm I'm really focusing on is, you know, I want to help other people. And I know in order to help other people, I have to help them unlock their potential. I have to teach them to learn to use the resources that God's already given them. Not to learn necessarily to add new things to them, but to learn that which is already within them and how to access those resources. And so, you know, I'm always sharpening the saw on neuro-linguistic programming, neuro-associative conditioning, with suggestive persuasive techniques, things that help people unlock their potential. You know, and I have to say two things, Paul. One is I was trained as a special ed teacher. And so my thinking was, you know, disability. That's how I was trained. And it's interesting because it's come full circle, not just when I started master leadership and started interviewing amazing individuals like you, but even before that, I hated the term disability. I liked the term difference at the time, but now is even different. And I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed with ADHD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, even neurosis, right? But they see it as their superpower. And it's just amazing. And so looking back at my career, I see that too. And in some of my kids who I adored, I really tried to connect with them. So that's one thing. The other thing I have to tell you is that, you know, I'm highly educated. However, and I want to tell you this, that you have been one of the most effective teachers that I've encountered. And when you speak, when you teach, you really speak to my heart. So, you know, I mean, we don't always agree on everything, but I love how you approach it because you approach it as I'm giving to them. And even what you said now, I want to learn how people learn and that's of interest to you. And that is beautiful. And so thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much, Paul. Now, Paul, when you think of leadership today, What most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? We've lost our moral compass. The runaway from God scares me. It really scares me. The runaway from family values. How willing our leaders are to marginalize and diminish men in a home and a family and marriage, even through our tax code. It scares me that we will settle for what's expedient rather than go the difficult path. Look, it's easy to take a stand on either side. It's much harder to remove the middle so there's no sides. And you've got to be willing to do that. You've got to be willing to stand for something or you fall for anything. Mm. And what scares me is, is how we demonize people. Like Just as I mentioned before, there's differences in races. There's differences now in genders. There's differences between whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. We've got leadership of polarization, and that really scares me. And seemingly, either side of those agendas could care less about the values. It's all about the end game, about the win at all cost, right? Right. That scares me. Uh, What gives me hope is, man, I'll tell you what, you look at this new generation of Gen Zers. Yeah. Pretty amazing people. I was just on a call last night with four young women under the age of 30. 
And I'll tell you what, they are on fire to change the world. And you and I grew up learning how to use technology, you know, and they've grown up with technology embedded in them. Yes, they have a chip. Yes. (laughs) Right. There's a chip. I mean, they, you know, they have no sales. They don't even know what a rotary phone is. Right. And so they're unwilling to put up with things that maybe you and I are willing to tolerate because, hey, you know, it's a little bit better than the way we had it. Right. Uh, But for them, it's completely unacceptable because they understand what's out there and what's possible. And they hold us accountable. They really do. They've got a moral compass and they've got values. And I know everybody beats up on the millennials, but there was certainly a phase in the millennial generation where there was a vibration or a frequency of entitlement that went through there. You don't find that in this group, in this new generation that's coming up. And it's really exciting to see them. And it's exciting to see them leapfrogging in leadership. Right now is a really exciting time. It's one of the very rare times in our history where we have all four generations active in the marketplace and actively competing in the marketplace from baby boomers to Gen Xers to millennials to Gen Zs. And I think what COVID did is, you know, normally we would see baby boomers leaving the marketplace. And because of COVID, they're staying. They're staying one, so there's not a brain drain, right? We certainly don't want the people with the most experience to leave the enterprise or the organization in the middle of a crisis. We want them. Some of them are staying because, you know, they had a plan of retirement and, you know, they're certainly not going to go off and travel and see Europe during the pandemic. So they might as well stay. So now they're staying which creates a backlog if you think about it, because now all of a sudden, you know, the Gen Xers who would normally, you know, take those corner suites or take those leadership positions or move up in the ranks now are kind of hanging in their position. Millennials who would then push in. And now you have all these new Gen Zers coming in. And what we're seeing is, is the Gen Zers have created real competition where Gen Zers are leapfrogging millennials for those better positions. And millennials are now really competing with a highly educated, really sophisticated, and I think elegant generation of Gen Zers who are coming in and in many ways kicking their butt and taking names. And so if you're a millennial, you know, you're having to really fight for your position because positions above you aren't opening and you've got new people coming into the marketplace who are gladly willing to take your $75,000 job and as their starting salary, thank you very much. And they're capable, they're smart. That's right. And the challenge is always to honor each other because to connect with different generations is so, so important. It certainly up levels us, up levels our thinking, but I think the other way around as well. Yeah, well, could you imagine an organization that has all four generations, what they could do through mentorship, where you can take those boomers, you know, you could take somebody who's in their late 60s, early 70s, with decades of experience, and place them with somebody who's just coming into the job market, who's really sharp. Imagine 10 years from now, oh my goodness, how much we're going to grow. Yes. Incredible. The future is so bright. It is. I love, love, love it. Now, Paul, you have an option here. You can take a question from a former guest, or you can share a challenge or a struggle that you learned from. Oh, I'll take a question. Why not? All right. So here we go. I love the other one. All right. So Dr. Trevor Blantner wants to know, what are the top three resources or books that you have consumed over the course of your leadership journey that have been most impactful? They Can Grow Rich would be one, anything by Thomas Troward. And then um, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself is an amazing book. And most people have never read it. No, I haven't either. It's an amazing, uh, Shad Homesteadler, an amazing, amazing book. He's an amazing man. You know, if you think about it, we talk to ourselves all day long. And so he talks about the four levels of self-talk. And, you know, how to get to that level, because, you know, as a leader, you duplicate who you are, you mass produce who you are. And if you don't love yourself, it's going to be really hard to love those that you lead. Absolutely right. You have to love those that you lead. I mean, when I was in the John Maxwell team, 
I loved our members. Like I loved our events. I would fight with the hotel to get any little extra I could on the buffet line or move the tables closer to the stage. How many people are going to get as close to the stage as possible? I fought for that for every inch because I love the members. And that, that's what you expect from a leader of your organization is that they're fighting for you. But you've got to love yourself. And I think this book is a really good book that'll help any leader and also helps a leader understand, you know, what the people they're leading are thinking, what they're saying to themselves. Love it. Thank you. I will certainly put that on my reading list. Yeah. You'll love it. You especially right. will love it. You know it. I would, right? I know you. Yeah. So, so, Paul, as a listener of this podcast, what is a question that you would like to pose to a future leadership guest? How do you resolve conflict on your team when both are right, when there's valid points on both, but there's a conflict, yeah, there's something there. How do you distill down to what is best organizationally? I think you've got to look at them and say, all of those are thoughts. And it's good that we think differently, but we have to believe the same. And so which one, if we were to live it all the way out, would be most in harmony with our core beliefs? I think. Okay. That's an excellent question. And I will certainly pose it to uh, an upcoming leader. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Here's one thing. And I think this is just so important for us. And we're not told this. It would be an impossibility. Like the entire universe would collapse. It would be a lawful impossibility for you to be aware of an idea and not be fully resourced to bring that idea forward in your life. So the minute we get an idea, what most of us do is we think in reverse, we get the idea, we look at our past results. And if our past results don't indicate that we could do it, then we say, I can't do it. The truth is, is if you can consciously become aware of the idea, you are automatically and instantly connected to every resource necessary for its fulfillment. Now, that doesn't mean that you have the awareness of those resources. It doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean you won't fail. All of that will happen. But you would not be able to conceive of the idea your thinking would not be able to tap into the vibrational frequency of that concept if within you, there wasn't the match in vibration, the know-how to bring it forward, a universal impossibility. And so be careful how quick you make an agreement with impossibility. Be very careful about how quickly you deny what you can't do. Be very careful about how quickly you marginalize or diminish your capacity to create. You're made in the image of God. God is the creator. All you do is create. All you do is create. I'm just suggesting that you can create intentionally and you can create by design. You were the one who brought this into my awareness. And there's so much value in what you're saying. And I know that you have a course that really digs deep into this. Can you speak about that real quick before we close out? Oddly enough, it's called Fully Resourced. And it's designed to be either a six-month or 12-month program. It's six hours of video content, one-on-one with me, and exercises in a workbook that go through at a guided pace. And then live interaction with me for two to three hours every month in a group setting for mentorship to guide you through the entire program. And um, people who have gone through it have said that it's changed their life. It's a really powerful program. So thank you. Thank you for letting me talk about it. And one last time, where they can get it. Paul at paulmartinelli.net. You can email me or paulmartinelli.net is the website. Beautiful. Paul, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. Oh, it's, thank you. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the podcast. Really appreciate you. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.